Rusty Kamori, and this is Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. I was the head coach of the Punahou Boys varsity tennis team for 22 years, and we were fortunate to win 22 consecutive state championships. This show is based on my books, Beyond the Lines and Beyond the Game, which many people find inspiring and motivating and helps you keep the right mindset in dealing with life's challenges. My special guest today is a COVID-19 survivor who was close to death in the hospital. And he'll share his personal experiences with us. And sadly, he's still feeling various after effects. He is George Ma, and today we are going beyond courage. Hey, George, welcome to the show. Hey, Rusty, thank you for having me on your show. How are George, you? Before we get into the COVID-19 situations, can you tell me a bit about your background growing up in Hawaii? Oh, I'm a local boy, born and raised in downtown Honolulu. Um, Chinese family, uh, parents had a Chinese restaurant, so typical, right? I was, there's four of us, uh, four siblings. I'm the youngest, uh, probably the most Rotten one out of the uh, four, you know. Um, I got, you see, I got into a lot of trouble, right? I was into um, just the typical things like skateboarding, like every local boy here. Um, I competed in body surfing uh, back in the days. Um, total foodie. Okay. So that's pretty much, you know, what what I do. <laughs> and and what schools did you go to? I went to all public schools. I grew up in the Liliha area. So I went to Kauluela. Then we moved to Nuano, to Kuanakoa, and I went to Roosevelt. I attended Roosevelt. George, you know, I know you are all about fitness. I mean, you're like the fitness king. In fact, you're the founder of uh, Lifestyle Fitness Training. Um, can you tell me about what kind of competitions you had entered in the past? Oh, in my past, I entered, um, I got into bodybuilding. So I competed in the Paradise Cup. I placed in that. I heavily into jujitsu and I placed in Naga, which is like a national jujitsu um, grappling championship here in Honolulu. Um, that, and actually now I work with people battling Parkinson's disease and I was selected out of four trainers in the US last year to train at a Parkinson's retreat. So George, that was very rewarding. I, I like hearing that you're helping, you know, people with Parkinson's and really training them and, and helping them uh, live a healthier lifestyle. Um, let's, let's get into the COVID-19 situations, George. So why did you end up getting tested for COVID-19? Uh, it started on the 4th of July um, weekend, actually, or that week of four, which I would never forget. That Monday, I went to a gym, one of my friend's gyms, and I I worked out, my, did my own personal workout. And then on Thursday, the owner of the gym gave me a call and said that I should get tested for COVID-19 because one of their staff members tested positive, which I did. Um, it took about two days and I got my test results and I was positive. So that's the reason why I got tested. So how, how did you really, I mean, how did you get it? Was it at the gym? Yeah, so at that time, it was still really early in the virus and we didn't know much about it. And the state mandate was that we were able to go to the gym, do our workouts, take classes and take off our mask, which, I did for one hour and that was such a hard lesson to learn because now we know that it's viral, it was in the air, you know. So that's something you know, that now, you know, I always keep my mask on, I wear protective eyewear, you know, but then that was just a hard lesson learned. You know, it was my fault. I could have kept my mask on, but at that, like you said, at that time it was still early. Um, I was part of the first cluster. So George, so you went to Straub Hospital 
Tell, tell me how bad it was um, with this dealing with the COVID-19 for you. For me, dealing with COVID-19, it started at home. I battled it for nine days at home. It started with me just feeling just tired and like I was having allergies, basically. So I took my Claritin thinking it was allergies. And then I started with a dry cough and then my chest got it really tight. Then from there, I started getting a fever that I couldn't break. And that was the first signs for me of COVID. I fought, I fought it for about nine days at home and to the point where I said, you know, I can't do it anymore. My blood oxygen levels, which um, usually should be at 100% reading, it came down to about 70%. Um, that's when I knew that I, I had to go to the hospital. And when I got to the hospital, I was near death. Basically, any uh, nurses and the doctor said if my blood oxygen levels were read under 70, my organs would have shut down. Maybe I would have got into a cardiac arrest. So this medical staff at Straub, they saved my life. George, tell me how bad it was during those first two days in the hospital in terms of breathing? The first day, I always say, I call COVID the beast because it comes in at night and it comes with this coughing spasm. But with these coughing spasms, you get muscle cramps, everything you can think of, your fever, you know, you're in and out um, because you're all drugged up from, you know, your cough medication and it feels like you're drowning. So that's, and that's the worst feeling. I remember using the PPE oxygen, which was against my nose. I would be shoving it against my nose, trying to, just trying to breathe. If you, and the first night, the bouts, those bouts would go on for hours. And I would ask the nurse to just let me fight, fight this um, virus, because I knew that if I went on a ventilator, it would be bad news for me and it would take me a long time to recover. So the first night I got through it, I had no idea it was gonna come again on the second night and it came again at me at, on the second night. And that's when my body was extremely exhausted. I just wanted to give up and I just needed to find purpose. And my purpose was my partner, my family and my Parkinson's family to help pull me through. And that, that gave me the fight for the second night. But at, at, at the end of the day, you're just suffocating, you know, and you just can't breathe. And it's your, it's your decision if you want to fight it or give up or, you know. So thank, I'm lucky that I have, you know, Parkinson's training in my back pocket, you know. So a lot of the symptoms is something that I train my clients with, not knowing that at the same time, I needed that same training to save my own life. Wow. So you could have easily just given up and died, basically. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a choice that you made to actually fight it. It was a choice. And I was very fortunate to have the nurse you know, watch over me at that time. It was still early in the virus. So the beds wasn't completely full yet. The hospital wasn't completely full yet. And you know, I thank him for watching my oxygen levels. Uh, and I made the choice yeah, to fight for those two nights. Most of my friends that are survivors, they ended up you know, in a coma. So to share this story with you, it's kind of fascinating because there's not too many people that actually, that I know that was up actually fighting it for two days. That was conscious. Yeah. So George, what type of therapeutics did your doctors prescribe for you? So right now, the therapy that we have, there's not much for COVID because right now they're still battling on the front lines. So I'm going back to my Parkinson's training and my therapy training that I do with my clients. And I'm following those protocols where um, I'm getting, I'm working with a cardiologist, a pulmonologist, yeah. And I'm trying to, basically this therapy journey, I'm, I'm, trying to find, I'm still trying to find a path 
you know, or working towards it. And while you were in the hospital, which medications worked for you? I actually was lucky that I qualified because of my health and my age. Uh, I had a triple crown combo of antivirals. One was um, Rendivir. Uh, another one was an anti-inflammatory steroid. And I was fortunate enough to get convalescent plasma. Those three brought me back to life, I believe. Wow. And George, you know, I know you know about my books and, you know, in my books, there's a part where I talk about, uh, you know, welcoming adversity, looking forward to challenges um, and really having the right mindset and the right perspective in dealing with life's challenges. And, and that's really what it sounds like you have to do as well. Yes. Being comfortable in an uncomfortable situation. So the two nights when I was fighting, I had to be able to calm my body down, um, mentally just focused on my breathing, uh, not let anything else bother me and just stay focused and think about, you know, I guess, you know, I don't know how to lose, so think about winning. And winning for me was just to not be on the ventilator and to stay alive. George, I, you know, it was so admirable. I, I, it was so courageous of you because while you were in the hospital, you posted videos uh, on Facebook about, you know, what you were dealing with at that time. And, and I, I know it really was eye opening uh, to so many people, including myself. I mean, was that a tough decision for you to do that? At first, um, I did it for my friends. So, I had about 400 Facebook friends. And then what, why I really pressed that send button it was because during the time at the hospital, I had a, the only thing I had with me because with this virus, you fight alone. I had, they, I had my phone. So I was scrolling through social media. And at that time, people were on social media were saying that this virus, you know, uh, it was a fluke, it is, it's fake news. And I just kind of got irritated and then I just pressed and I gave me more courage to press send, which I did. And then I woke up the following day and within I think 48 hours it went viral. And then that's when I, I honestly, then that's when I kind of got nervous, you know, but then I saw all the love and strength and people sending me positive comments that kept me going. And actually it was a great form of therapy because the power of prayer, you know, gave me the strength to fight daily because when I was in a hospital on day three, you know, as a healthy, you know, I, I always been healthy. I was, you know, I could barely even comb my hair. I was using a walker. Wow. Hey, George, prayers definitely help. And I know that once you recovered uh, from COVID, from, from being in the hospital, you you I mean you have all these after effects. Can you tell me what type of um, situations you're dealing with right now? Yeah, you know, so, so a lot of people they think that you know, like any flu, which is, this is not a flu. This this is a virus. It's a very strong virus. That like a flu, you you know, once it's over, it's over, and it's not. You know, you don't just check out of the hospital, and it's 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 done. You know, so everyone's symptoms are different. For me, I'm, I'm not 100% yet. I, I battle with chronic fatigue. Uh, I still have shortness of breath, um, inability to recover while I'm exercising, which I love to do, um, difficulty sleeping. We have what they call COVID fog, which is concentrating and, and staying focused. And the last thing, probably I do have a resting tremor in my right hand, which I never had any of these problems before. And the, the sad thing is that the, the doctors, they can't, they, can't they, can't, they can't tell me if, when it's gonna go away. Yeah, so I'm just something that I'm just dealing with daily. So George, tell me more about your, the tremors in your right hand. I mean, what, how bad is it right now? It's, a, it's got a resting tremor. So more so when I'm at rest, it, you know, um, the tremor act up a little more. So it, like as I say, if I'm writing, 
it's not that I can't write, but it, I kind of lose my balance. So I've been working on my therapy, working on my writing, working on my hands, my dexterity of my fingers, getting that moving. moving. Um, I'm working with a chiropractor. This is me, you know, maybe um, he can help adjust me. Maybe it might be on certain nerves. So I'm trying that route. You know, I'm trying, I'm trying anything. I'm open to try, you know, to try anything to get better. Now, I, you also did an MRI. Why did you do an MRI? With this resting tremor, I saw a neurologist and they actually tested me for Parkinson's disease. It came out negative. So, because this was, neuro, um, I had these neurological um, problems. That was just another way to kind of see what was going on. And at the same time, when these doctors are done fighting on the front line with COVID, they have a COVID brain that they can study. So yeah, I kind of did it for science too. That's good. And, and George, you know, what, what happened when you wanted to donate plasma? Oh, wow. That's, that was crazy. Um, when I was in the hospital, the nurse would, you know, we would always try to find a positive. And the positive was that I was able to donate plasma and save and help save other lives, you know, and what, what a great way to kind of give back, you know, because they helped me and, you know, and plasma did help save my life. So when I got better, I actually counted the days. I caught um, the blood bank and with, with that, what happened was that they, 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 um, I qualified to give plasma, but they did a phone interview. And during a phone interview, um, I, saw, I was talking about my partner and my sexuality. And then everything kind of went kind of silent, like you got the sign. And the person on the other line said that I won't, won't be able, they won't be able to take my plasma because of my sexuality. So that kind of just blew my mind. Just, it's just so backwards thinking, you know. Uh, so I, was, I wasn't able to get plasma because of my sexuality. Well, and here you are, you, I mean, plasma really saved you, you said, and you wanted to pay it forward and to really help other people, but maybe they might have to look into that kind of rule because it seems like it's an outdated rule. Yeah, it's outdated rule, you know, um, sexual orientation, you know, that it goes back to the days when um, HIV and AIDS, you know, so we're still, I think they just passed a law for, uh, um, for us to give um, blood, but then there's still a lot of rules that comes along with it for the LGBTQ community. You know, we're still, we're still fighting for those rights to be able to give, donate blood and especially plasma now, which is so, so needed. George, you know, the, the nurses and doctors, tell me your thoughts about the nurses and doctors. The nurses and doctors, I call them angels. And you know, when they would come into my room, I would say to them, you know, they're doing God's work. And because they are, you know, they'll be taken care of, you know, their family will be taken care of, you know, later. Uh, because at, a lot of times, at that time, a lot of the nurses I found out, they volunteered to work in that COVID unit, which really touched my heart. I'm like, wow, you know, that's such a risk. You know, why would you want to work, you know, in this unit? So, and there's a lot of sacrifice for them to work there um, because with the PPEs that they got to wear, you know, each time they would come into my room, they would have to change into new PPEs. Uh, and I think one day I counted 25 times, you know, throughout the day they came into my room, they had to take off and keep changing to new gowns and, and, and gloves, you know. So it's, it's so stressful. So, you know, I try not to bother them that much because I know they're really busy. So George, you know, people think, you know, it, this only affects senior citizens with, you know, certain conditions that, that they might be dealing with. But, you know, you're a, you're a young guy with, I mean, and 
super physically fit, as we saw in those pictures. What what is your advice to everyone out there? Um, you know, knowing that COVID nineteen is still the same now as it was months ago. I think what I would say is, COVID is it's not a joke. It does not discriminate. You know, look at me. It almost killed me. So I would want people to, you know. It sounds like I'm repeating myself, but it's needed. Mask up, you know, wear protective eyewear, no social gatherings, if, wear gloves if you have them. And especially if you are tested positive and during those 14 days, you know, have somebody monitor you daily, you know, especially if you have a fever and check your blood oxygen level, which is key to saving your life. So George, you know, going, th you know, through these uh, oh, major adversities, these big challenges that you dealt with, what do you, what, what is your biggest fear now in life? My biggest fear now, the unknowns of COVID, of the symptoms that's coming at me, you know, um, not knowing if I'm able to work eight hour days anymore, you know, not knowing when these symptoms are going to go away, you know, I, uh, that's having a, you know, having this chronic disease, you know, it does, it, it scares me, you know, but I try not to think about it, you know, uh, daily. I try to just think about what's going on within the day or maybe within the hour, you know, and then try to just celebrate the wins because I still do have bad days and I have, I'm having a lot more better days now. You know, but I just need to celebrate the good days. So George, you know, being close to death like you were, I mean, I, I can't imagine, you know, feeling like you can't breathe because you're feeling like you're drowning. But, you know, going through that experience and then looking back now, what do you feel is most important in life? First, I think um, I just feel blessed first to be alive, you know to be alive and to have people in my life that cares about me, like my family, my partner. Um, what's amazing was just having even strangers at that time on social media support me and you know, show me love. Yeah. So I cherish all the little things you now in life. And I try not to sweat over, you know, my business too much and how many clients I need to have, you know, and just, just breathe actually, and you know, just breathe and just enjoy the hour and the minutes, you know, that, that I have during that day. Yeah. Really looking at the big picture and not really sweating the small stuff. Right, George. Yeah. I was a guy that, you know, I'm a planner, you know, I'm uh, even in my, with my friends and you know, when we do trips and everything, I plan everything out from the minutes to the hour. I, I was that guy, and now I, looking back at it, you know, in the hospital room, you know, it's just finding, you know, what's enough. And now I think with that, I know what I need and what's enough in life for me. And it took me laying in the hospital and almost dying to figure that out. So with this new perspective, uh, like a different perspective on life now, what are, what are some of your future goals? What are some things that you want to accomplish? I still want to accomplish um, working with my Parkinson's family. You know, um, I, I want to keep working with them. Maybe come up with a therapy program for what we call long haulers, people, survivors of COVID-19, figuring out a therapy program for them. That's something I would love to do and trying not to go past that because then that's what gets you know me back to where i used to be you know getting my anxieties up and you know getting panic attacks and so george you know why why is um you know you helping parkinson's patients why is that such a big passion of yours um my dad had parkinson's he passed away about two years ago. And during that time, I was trying to find a therapy program for him and I couldn't find anything that was 
I wanted to say everything was pretty dated. And because I specialize in fitness and, and I do a lot of therapy work. And actually I started, when I first started training 20 years ago, <laughs> I were, uh, my specialty was senior fitness. So I've been around chronic illness and movement disorders my whole life. And I knew that you know, if I put some work into it, I could come up with a program for my dad, but it was this, and which now I do have, but it was just a little too late. So that's the reason why uh, Parkinson's is very dear, near and dear to my heart. Yeah, got it. And and George, you know, I, I know that you uh, also uh, teach Muay Thai kickboxing and, and that has so many benefits for people. Can you, can you tell me about what benefits uh, Muay Thai kickboxing does? Oh yeah, so for Muay Thai kickboxing, when I first started Muay Thai kickboxing, I came from a bodybuilder background. So, you know, it was all show, no go. Sorry to my bodybuilder friends, but I was really tight, I had zero flexibility, you know, had no con hardly any uh, cardio or conditioning. You know, back then, there wasn't anything like CrossFit. It was just strictly old school bodybuilding. And then I got into kickboxing and I, I'm a guy that hated to stretch. So my balance was bad. And just learning a skill set like kickboxing, not re knowing, not realizing at the same time as I was learning this, you know, self-defense sport, I was gaining um, flexibility, balance, you know, and that's exactly what I use to, um, for my clients to, it's like, I always say it's like just like a cooler way of stretching out your limbs because it, Muay Thai is called the art of eight limbs, right? So, and then at the same time, it's like a all-in-one. To me, I think for conditioning, that's probably one of the best sports um, you can do to get conditioned and you don't have to be a fighter. You get a great workout just with a heavy bag. Well, George, you know, that's why I call you the fitness king. <laughs> and, and George, I really want to thank you for joining me on the show today and really, you know, talking about your personal experiences. I know it's going to help uh, countless people out there. Thank you, Rossi, for um, letting me um, spread more COVID awareness. You know, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you, George, and I'll, I'll talk to you soon, okay? Thank you, yes, you, guys, uh, you have a great day, and uh, we'll, we'll chat later. And, and thank you for watching Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. For more information, please visit rustykomori.com, and my books are available on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble. I hope that George's experiences and insights will help you and the people you care about. Aloha.